Good evening, everyone. My name is Shari Potter, and I am the co-chair of the Parents Leadership Community uh, at the Basser Center for BRCA. Uh, for those of you who are new to us tonight, the Basser Center was established in 2012 by my sister and her husband, Mindy and John Gray, and is the first center uh, solely dedicated to the research, treatment, and prevention of BRCA-related cancers. The Parents Leadership Community was established in 2019 and is a, a supportive forum for parents with children who have or may be faced with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations. And we hope to also be a resource um, to help you stay informed about the latest on BRCA research and care. So on behalf of the Pastor Center, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's discussion, uh, a BRCA family affair. If you have any questions for our panelists, please add them to the chat box uh, throughout our discussion. We'll try and get to as many of them as we can. Uh, the opinions and experiences shared tonight uh, are our panelists' own and do not represent those of the Basler Center, uh, the PLC, or Penn Medicine. And you should consult with your own healthcare provider if you have any questions about the specifics of your health and medical plan. So thank you to our panelists, Allie Rogan and her parents, Rebecca and Max Weinberg, for joining us this evening to share their family's journey after discovering they were BRCA mutation carriers. Allie Rogan is the author of the book, Beat Breast Cancer Like a Boss, and a producer with the PBS NewsHour Foreign Affairs team, writing and reporting pieces for TV and the web. Her reports have also appeared on MSNBC, ABC, Sirius XM, and nationally syndicated FM radio shows. A New Jersey native, Allie lives with her husband in Washington, D.C. Max Weinberg, or Mighty Max as you may know him, is the incredibly talented drummer for Bruce, Springs, Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band. Max has also found great success as the uh, musical uh, director and band leader for Late Night with Conan O'Brien. Rebecca Weinberg is a lifelong activist, volunteer, and educator. Rebecca, but Rebecca is a passionate activist for animals and is a volunteer with Personal Ponies, a miniature pony therapy organization that works with children. She also sings and plays the harmonica in a band called the Fa Fa Fa's. Dr. Susan Domchek, who will be moderating our discussion, is a medical oncologist at Penn Medicine's Abramson Cancer Center. She is the Basser Professor in Oncology, and of course, the Executive Director of the Basser Center for BRCA. Dr. Domchek's work focuses on the genetic evaluation and medical management of individuals with inherited risk factors for cancer. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our incredible, incredible leader, Dr. Susan Domchek. Well, thank you so much, Sherry, and thank you for organizing this incredible event tonight. Uh, to get started, I just wanted to say that I've been working in the field of BRCA1 and 2 for 25 years. And one of the key things that comes up every time we counsel someone about having a BRCA1 or 2 mutation is, how do I talk to my family? How do I talk to my kids? What does this mean for my children? It's, we often say that we don't test individuals, we test families. And the interaction uh, between families is so important. And so I think it's critically important to hear this story tonight um, about how uh, people communicate and what challenges they may have. So we're gonna get started with, with you, Max. Um, I understand that you <clears throat> discovered you had a BRCA mutation not that long after we started testing for them. Can you tell us your story? Well, certainly, Doctor. Um, my, uh, I'm one of four children in my uh, family, um, Two older sisters. My oldest sister discovered at the age of 56, uh, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and um, wasn't, hadn't been tested. Uh, she uh, passed away in, in the summer of 2000. And sometime shortly after that, it was the end of 2000, the beginning of 2000, I tested and determined the BRCA1 gene. And uh, my family history was, uh, as you can imagine, Eastern European, Belarus to be exact. And um, my uh, mother 
who uh, uh, passed away at 98, uh, did not have the gene. Um, uh, my father was never tested. He passed away in, in uh, 84. So I'm assuming he passed it on to us. My second oldest sister doesn't have it. My youngest sister does. So um, uh, that, uh, uh, that is a bit of our, uh, my family history uh, in, uh, tw what was it, 2000 and, uh, I've had so many surgeries, I'm losing track. 2011, uh, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. And, uh, and I'm someone who uh, has always been very proactive about my health and uh, got tested uh, nearly every six months for the last five years before I was diagnosed. Um, so I, I, uh, my learning curve regarding prostate cancer uh, was very, very steep. And uh, I asked the, the, uh, my uh, physician, who uh, is still the, I believe, the, uh, the head of surgery at Sloan Kettering, uh, gee, do we can you know, I'm so up on this, do we catch it early? And he said, well, not particularly. And, uh, and it had only been about six or eight months because I was undergoing um, the year before that major heart surgery. Uh, so that was very interesting to learn the, uh, the velocity of change was extremely rapid, uh, but it all started with really getting tested and having a uh, propensity to have this uh, 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 cancer show up. I'm not out of the woods, but I still have the gene. Yeah. I don't have the prostate anymore, but I'm still, <laughs> I still have the gene. So I, I just wanted to ask, uh, we often hear about families where it, it isn't recognized for a while that the family's at risk for having a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. So who told you to get tested? How did you know to go do that? I don't recall to tell you the truth i think it um um it, it wasn't my sister mm -hmm. uh, uh you know it may have been my younger sister who i think it was my younger sister who's six years younger than me who uh is a uh a social worker up in massachusetts and very very proactive about everything and uh, uh you know you must get tested uh she mm -hmm. knew about the uh brca one and two and it was her suggestion. Yeah, and I, I wanted to, you know, just emphasize a point. And and I uh, I believe you're of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Again, as you mentioned, Eastern European. And if if someone has ovarian cancer and is of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, there's a one in three chance that they have a BRCA one or two mutation. And so, you know, uh, your family was an excellent candidate for genetic testing and remains so. Uh, but at the time, it was still early days. So I'm glad your sister was so proactive. So now you have this piece of information. So Rebecca and Max, your parents, how, what was that conversation like between the two of you about this information and how you were thinking about it impacting you know, yourselves and your children? I don't know, Rebecca, maybe first to you. Okay, well, <clears throat> when we first found out about it, um, it was, it was, do we tell, you know, when do we tell Allie that, you know, she needs to be tested for this? And at that point, I think she was around 10. And I, can't, I was resistant to the idea of having that discussion at that point because, you know, there's really not, not much that you can do and why burden her with this scary thing? And quite frankly, it it was sort of like blissful ignorance for me to not have to deal with it for a little while. But then there was the, you know, the, okay, this is gonna to have to be done at some point. And, uh, and it was, I guess, you know, when she was in college, we decided that, yeah, you know, you, you, gotta, you gotta go and have this, uh, have this checked out. And, and Max, from your end, you know, it's, it's I, I find that, that parents, both men and women, but sometimes particularly men, the idea of passing along a gene mutation to their little girl can feel particularly heartrending. What was this all like for you? It, you know, and other people are like, this is empowering information. I'm giving this gift of knowledge. Usually it's a little bit of both, by the way, but I'm curious what your reaction was. Well, you, you hope, of course, as a parent that your children inherit your good genes. And I think in the case of the hair gene, uh, Allie and I have uh, 
uh, we're we're both good on those counts. I'll be seventy in six six weeks, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm happy for that. You know, it was really uh, thinking back. It was more. This is a fact. You have to deal with facts. Fortunately, in 2021, uh, the advances are so considerable in both diagnost diagnostics, uh, treatments, being aware of it, uh, even in finding out. In fact, when when I did have when I was tested, it was very early. I had it done at NYU on the east side of Manhattan, uh, uh, in the sort of hospital range there, and it was unusual and um uh but but i think the the our family generally dealt with these uh issues as uh you know uh solve the problem work the problem uh whether it's being aware of it staying aware of it doing what you can of course in ali's case it was a um a a very dedicated regime of proactivity which uh for a 20 year old uh was very, very impressive, um, even if she wasn't my daughter, but extremely impressive, taking charge of, of what was going on uh, and the potential of what could go on. And that's something I'll let Ali address, of course. But, um, you, you know, you, you, in, in, our, in, in my case specifically and generally in our family, it's get the information, do your due diligence. I have been told by older relatives the first words out of my mouth or due diligence, <laughs> get the information. There's a lot of information out there. Um, uh, we don't have enough time for my thoughts on the diagnosis of prostate cancer and various treatments, but uh, it's all about a learning curve. And the more information you have, uh, the better informed you are to make the right decision for you and to do what you can uh, to give yourself the best chance of dealing with it successfully. There's so many factors that we have no control over the one fact you do have control over is knowledge. You can learn uh, just so much about about these type uh, uh, subjects. And I think I hope we will get back to more of the discussion about prostate cancer later because it's very important. Men sometimes get lost in this conversation about its relevance to them. So, so I will get back to that. But Ali, I'm just curious. You're 20 years old. What do you remember about that conversation? I mean, did they prep you with, you know, a drink or, or how, how did it go? It's so funny. I remember it vividly. I think we were in the car actually driving home. I had come home for a visit or something like that. This was in my junior year of college. And they basically brought it up in a calm, um, straightforward way, which is typically how my parents have broken bad news to us over the years. Um, however, uh, and this impacted how I received the news, we've been blessed and so lucky that we as a family haven't really endured a whole lot of hardship, um, to be completely honest. We're, I'm, I had an incredibly privileged upbringing. Um, there was no um, severe illness in the family. There was no um, you know, I never really experienced tremendous hardship to be perfectly honest with you. And so when I received this news, I remember thinking, if this is what it means to weather a challenge, um, this is, uh, I got a pretty good deal on this, that if this is my, you know, um, gauntlet as I become an adult, this I can deal with. I'm hand, you know, uh, the, the, the choice was initially given to me as, you can get tested, you don't have to. I think my parents probably knew that I, like them, was a big believer in knowledge being power. And so it was, uh, I didn't have to think about it that of course I wanted to go get tested. Um, that whole conversation though, and that um, series of decisions were made in very, very short order. And I think really, um, just looking straight ahead, because as my dad said, I mean, we as a family do address things head on. We look at the facts and we make our decisions based on those sets of facts. And this was really no different. Yeah. And I think it's important you know, to emphasize that family dynamics and, and family personalities play a big role. Uh, there are, uh, there are uh, young women for whom their parents know that this is going to be much more anxiety provoking. And there, and the 
if you will, parents know their kids the best. They know how they weathered things over their lifetime. Um, and they are usually the best at figuring out you know, when, when to broach this conversation. Although I will admit that you also learn to talk about sex ed in the car when everyone's facing forward. So when you said that uh, they brought it up in the car, I did, did get a chuckle out of that. <laughs> so, so you have this information now. Um, tell me about getting your genetic testing results. I think you were with your mom when that, that occurred. <clears throat> Yes, um, my mom and I went together again to the NYU Medical Center. I was a student at NYU at the time. And um, actually, uh, let me let me rephrase that. I went in for the consultation myself. So I met with the genetic counselor and then went down the hall to get my blood drawn uh, by myself, which was no big deal. I already knew that I was a good candidate. Um, we went over my family history. Um, I remember vividly how she drew these little boxes to represent each member of my family tree. And she put those who had died of cancer in a black box, which was very, very foreboding. And then I, so, you know, went in, had a consultation. I knew uh, what to expect. And then my mom came with me later, uh, you know, a few weeks later when the results came in and we had lunch together at our favorite little bistro that we had discovered a couple blocks away from NYU Medical Center. We had, I think a glass of Sauvignon Blanc each because we were stealing ourselves for whatever the results were. And we went in and we sat down and the first words out of the genetic counselor's mouth were, it's positive. And it was, you know, I mean, I knew that I had a pretty good chance of having it, um, but it was still a shock to hear those words. Um, there's just such a visceral, I think, impact that those words have that even though, again, we were very prepared, we both broke down crying. She had tissues at the ready to give to us. But to be honest, it was what happened next that uh, really um, made me develop some strong feelings about uh, the role of genetic counselors in all of this. Uh, and so uh, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn too much by editorializing a little bit, but in my experience, and granted this was almost 12 years ago now. So I think there's been a lot learned since then, but I immediately wanted to know, okay, what can I do? What are my options? Like, and I wanted to know, I am the kind of person, and again, raised by my parents to do this, to interrogate the doctor to know what questions to ask beforehand and to not be afraid. I'm also a journalist, so I think that has something to do with it. But I went in and I wanted to know what could I do to address my high risk of, in the immediate term, the concern was breast cancer. Um, and the genetic counselor focused on what I could do to reduce my risk of ovarian cancer. I think in retrospect, she did that because having a prophylactic bilateral mastectomy uh, while in college was seen still as a relatively radical move. I suppose it still is, but there's been a lot um, of an evolution, I think, in just the perception of the procedure and of the mutation um, in the years uh, since I went through this. But she focused on, again, remove, you know, she said, you should remove your ovaries by the age of 35. Maybe you should think about having children earlier in life than you would otherwise. And I'm sitting there, I'm like a 19 year old college kid. That information is irrelevant to me. I can't act on that. That's not helpful. I'm not thinking about when I'm having children. I, I don't even have, I, like, I was thinking of breaking up with my boyfriend. Like, you know, it was not part of my um, plan. And so I felt that she had done me a disservice by not mentioning a more broad complement of my options. Not necessarily because one is right for everybody, but I think precisely because it's not one size fits all. And I think um, it's important for counselors that the, as the first line of defense, I left that meeting and I think my mom did too, completely freaked out, um, crying all the way, uh, you know, taxi drivers in New York are so wonderful. We had a taxi driver who I was telling him my sob story and he was like, well, I have friends who've had their legs blown off. Um, he was like this lovely man and kind of talked us both off a ledge. Um, but it wasn't until later we went to some additional appointments. I think my mom was there for most of them. And I learned a little bit more about my other options. And that prophylactic bilateral mastectomy with reconstructive surgery was an option I, could, I should consider. And in fact, once I learned that that was also on the table, 
I decided that day that that was what I was going to do. But again, I just felt that I would have benefited, my mental health would have benefited if in that initial consultation with my mom, we wouldn't have been left uh, on the ledge as, as we were. And so I think uh, you're raising yeah, in fact, I believe an important point, which is that, that, uh, that information, you know, you both, all three of you have stressed the importance of information uh, and getting facts and data. And, um, and you're right, I think there's been a move more recently to really trying to give people uh, shorter term risk estimates so for instance, you know, what's your risk, even if you have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, what's your risk over the next five years? What's your risk over the 10 years? What are the broad options? But when those kind of come into play, you know, really thinking this, you know, of this as a lifetime, a lifetime process of decision-making, not sort of an in the moment, you know, the idea that talking to a 19 year old, you're talking to them about their children and their ovaries, you know, as, as something that, should be in their immediate planning is very tough. So Rebecca, what was your, what's your, you know, feedback from that, that, that? Well, I, I was, I, when Allie and I went to see the oncologist um, after we had had this discussion with the genealogist, um, it was a completely different experience. That's when we, I think Allie, you and I, when we left, both of us felt like a weight had been lifted off of our shoulders because her, it just had this really easily understood explanation as to what exactly BRCA was. And then she laid out the menu of options and one of them was, well, some girls go this route. And it basically, Allie and I laugh and called it, well, it's just a medically necessary boob job. And um, it, uh, we both left there feeling so much better. And I think you decided like right on the spot that, yeah, this is, this is, this is what, you know, we're going to do this and, and, uh, and it's going to be, it's going to be fine. Actually, yeah. this is, you know, cause it, yeah, when we left the, the genealogist's office, I felt shattered. I felt shattered. I mean, I, I just, uh, there was really nothing that we were going to do right away. And I just thought my daughter is just going to sit there and wait for cancer to yeah. Yeah. find her. So, so, and so going to this, this oncologist was like, it was a little scary just going to an oncologist. That was just a little unnerving to begin with, but this woman was just so matter of fact and calm about it and just like okay well this is one thing that you could do and it just made so much sense so there's uh the the you know in in oncology school if you will we always learn that the one thing you want to have is a plan and you know this is what you're reflecting yeah. right when you don't have a plan it causes actually a lot more anxiety uh and that you know when people are newly diagnosed with cancer until there's a plan that's that's sort of the worst period of time um no it yeah, is Real quick, and just say that just because this was the right choice for me doesn't mean it's the right choice for everybody else. Um, and Dr. Domchek, I'm sorry, I'm sure that was about the point you were going to make. But you know, if also it would have been great if I had known that I could begin um, MRIs and um, you know uh, do start early surveillance. If that had been also mentioned as a as a potential um, option, it just as you said, it would have been better to have left that office with at least a, a sense of what the plan could be. And so we, um, you know, we often talk about testing at 25 because that's when MRIs generally occur and that we know that for some people getting tested earlier and then not doing anything specific except breast MRI, except like breast exams can feel extremely unnerving. So this is part of the discussion that we have, you know, with women who, you know, get tested earlier. And as you said, Allie, different approaches are the right thing for different people. We've had you know, 18 and 19 year olds come in and say, well, you know, we'll start screening you at 25 if you're positive. And they say, okay, I'll be back then. Thank you very much. And there are other people who, you know, very much want that information ahead of time. And it's, it's, it's very different. So, but I, Ali, I wanted to ask you, so you had uh, a preventive mastectomy at an early age, you know, your friends weren't doing that, you know, you were dating. I mean, 
tell us what was that like and 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 max and rebecca what was that like to support your daughter through this when you know you know most 20 21 year olds were not doing this yeah it was um an interesting time to be doing all of this um in fact one of the only regrets i have in life frankly i don't really have regrets but um i and i would recommend this to anybody considering this route um i don't have any pictures of my natural breasts like that i just didn't take any it just wasn't you know i i didn't make it a point to i have a couple medical photos that were taken before the surgery and those are the only images i have of my natural breasts and i didn't realize how much those images actually meant to me once they were gone um I, I didn't know that that's how I was going to feel. Um, I really didn't feel a great like appreciation for my breasts while I had you know my natural ones because they were they were small and I thought this is so great. This is actually like a wonderful chance to get an upgrade and I I sure did. I went a little bigger, um, and that's really though how I approach this and how I think any anxiety I had about my relationships or you know, just moving through life as a, I think I was, ended up being 20 when I got the surgery. I was, I ended up being, a, I was a senior in college. It was a couple months before I graduated. Um, so I had um, been dating. I actually, this is, this is relevant to the timeline. I had broken up with my boyfriend um, between the mastectomy and the reconstructive surgery. And so when I was done, he kind of, he was wonderful and supported me through everything. And he was the exemplary boyfriend you want to have when you're a college senior and you're going through something like this. But, you know, we went, went, went in different directions. And so I did end up going back into the dating scene, like very briefly after I was recovering from um, the second surgery, from the implants. Um, so at that point, I mean, I got lucky because I had a wonderful partner there to support me. And of course, um, also, I mean, my mom was there and my dad, but my mom was basically my nurse every step of the way. So I was just incredibly cared for and always felt so cared for. It was really actually a, a special experience in that sense. But, um, Allie, yes, you should tell them about the, the girl that we met at the bar. <laughs> yes. Um, so a lovely girl. Thank you for bringing this up. I mean, and this, that was another, yeah. Great. Um, we, my doctor, and I'm, I'm sure this is standard procedure now for um, surgeons, if you go this route, he connected me with another one of his patients who was a few years older than me, had gone through everything, uh, got married, you know, was super happy. And my mom and I met her for a drink at a restaurant in Midtown. And she was like, you want to see him? And so she brought me into the bathroom at the restaurant and just flashed me and showed me the finished product. And I was like, oh my God, you look amazing. This is great. Um, and so that really put me at ease. And of course, since then, I've done the same thing for lots of women, um, you know, to try to put them at ease that this is not that big of a deal, uh, you know, cosmetically. I have never felt so confident as I did after I had um, my surgeries. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it just um, ended up being, I think because I was approaching it in my mind as at the end of the day, a wonderful way to reduce my risk and not have to worry about this thing hanging over my head. And also as a way to like get slightly bigger boobs. I mean, that's, that's the attitude I brought into it. And that's the attitude I still have about it. And, and, you know, I, I think that for you, for you, it's, it's, you know, you have this incredibly supportive uh, family and you have such great communications and you had a, a clear idea in your mind. I think a lot of women, it's, it's harder. Their decisions are harder. There is a lot more, um, you know, concern about sexuality and body image and dating and breastfeeding. And so this is why, as you brought up, you know, these decisions can be you know, very uh, challenging uh, for each individual. Um, I also wanted to make a, a comment that just to, to mention, I'm sorry that that your experience with the Janet counselor um, uh, wasn't as good as it should have been. Uh, the Janet counselors that I work with are some of the best, best people and the, the, our best advocates. 
And so, um, and, um, and so there, and there's possibilities of getting J counseling opinions, uh, second opinions, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah. So I just want to just make uh, clear that um, JAG counselors can be extremely useful, just like there are good doctors and, you know, doctors that miss the mark sometimes that can happen, you know, with genetic counseling um, as well. So I'm, I'm sorry you were left hanging. I mean, there's nothing worse than feeling, uh, feeling. No, but, you know, what, one thing I will say quickly is that in researching my book, um, that was one of the things that really stuck out is that, and perhaps we should have done this is go to a second genetic counselor instead of going right to the oncologist. You know, um, if you're not happy with somebody, don't continue to see that person for your care, no matter what it is. You should always feel comfortable and you should also always feel empowered to get exactly what it is you want out of uh, your medical setting. So, and, and Max, what was this like to watch your daughter go through this uh, it, and uh, you know, recover from this? And I mean, she's an incredibly strong person and successful, uh, but still it must've been a hard, hard couple of weeks, months. Well, it's a great question actually, because um, it was a, it's a continuum from birth before birth to 20 when this uh, these events happened and every step of the way whether it was uh, uh, you know breaking an arm uh, uh, falling down on the ice skating Allie's a wonderful skater and uh, and being really badly injured the poise and uh, sense of calm that in, uh, in, a, in this, uh, facing these types of uh, events or knowledge, uh, that sense of calm really uh, helped. And again, so for me, it was sort of, well, she knows herself. She's done her research. She's, uh, uh, this isn't drastic. This wasn't a spur of the moment decision to have a bilateral radical mastectomy. This was uh, the result of careful research and emotional uh, stock that she took. So I was, uh, uh, I was okay. You know, I, I knew that uh, with Becky's, uh, you know, incredible support and mine, uh, uh, but really Becky's, let's, you know, uh, who, who was there, you know, 24 seven and um, attending to every, uh, everything, you know, they're both, uh, whatever stoicism, I believe we get in our family comes from Becky. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, you will get through it. There's, you know, the light is dim, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, you know, I've had in, uh, in my personal medical experience, as I said, I lose track of how many uh, surgeries for mechanical situations from my performing career or in the case of my uh, heart, uh, genetic defects uh, that was quite invasive. Um, uh, uh, malignancies are a completely different set of rules and reactions because that's organic in my view. I'm, you know, I'm not, obviously I'm not a practitioner, but uh, mechanical versus organic, and uh, that lends an extra dimension of apprehension. But I was, as I said earlier in this uh, 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 evening, uh, I was uh, deeply impressed with Ali's poise, a sense of herself, sense of her future self. I'm fine with this. You know, uh, the way she approached it, she said, as, uh, you know, the cosmetic surgery component uh, that was very typical. It's sort of uh, taking lemons and making lemonade. And uh, you're in this situation, you know, nobody's going to help you out of it in the end, but yourself, whether you're five, 15 or 50 uh, or older, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, the ultimate decision is yours. So if you trust your children, which we do, you know, our mantra as parents, uh, I was a uh, uh, 30, 36, I think, when Ali was born, uh, was uh, to them, if you act responsibly, you'll be given great responsibility. And, and they did. And here we are sort of, you know, Ali and her brother, who's three years younger. Uh, yes, they act responsibly. They take charge. I think that's indicative of uh, uh, the book Ali uh, wrote, uh, 
you know, beat cancer. You, you, uh, you if you're, if you're among the fortunate, you beat it. If uh, at every step of the way, you have to beat it back. You have to do what you can. And generally, as we've been talking about, that deals with uh, knowledge and the ever increasing velocity of uh, medical protocols, getting better and better all the time. And, uh, you know, and with that in mind, I, you know, I just want to emphasize the point that we started with, with you, you know, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, you know, if you lined up all the BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers in the world, half of them are men, and those men can pass these gene mutations along to their children, and they also are at risk for cancers themselves. So BRCA2 is a little worse, is worse for men than BRCA1 in terms of male breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer. But BRCA1 also has risks for um, male breast cancer and prostate cancer. So you're, you're talking about your prostate cancer so openly is important, not only to make sure people are screened that have these two mutations, but there's increasingly specific medications that we can use uh, to treat um, you know, advanced prostate cancer in the setting of BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. So uh, we don't hear from enough men with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So uh, we, we appreciate you uh, sharing that. Allie, I wanted to ask you any tips for two things. Tips on dating, like when do you tell? And secondly, you know, any specific tip you have on the surgery that was something you wish you had known? There's probably a lot, but give us, give us a couple of tips. Oh man, what do I wish I had known? Um, well, on the first one, um, this is awkward because my parents are on the Zoom, but I will try to uh, speak in euphemisms. Um, you know, when I was dating uh, and getting to know somebody, um, I didn't bring it up in advance of when uh, they might see my boobs. Um, and then it was just kind of like, hey, uh, I just have, I have something to tell you. And, you know, usually when you say something like that and you're in like a sexual encounter, um, the person's probably gonna not jump to the conclusion that you've had a double mastectomy. They're probably thinking you're about to tell them, I don't know, I have an STD or like I, I have a child or something terrible. And so, you know, usually when you come out with it, uh, in my experience, it's been no big deal. And my other mantra is that if a guy or a girl or whoever was to have a problem with it, then that's a great reason why you shouldn't be interested in them anymore and why they're not worth your time. Um, my husband also has uh, a funny way. I mean, obviously I went through that with him. Like, I mean, you know, I just kind of told him in the moment, look, uh, I had a double mastectomy. It was like, I don't know, at that point, it was like eight years ago. Uh, and he said, okay. And then we just, you know, went on our way. <laughs> and um, uh, my husband's joke though is, you know, if I can feel them, they're real. So <laughs> it has not meant anything to him. Uh, and look, again, I was so lucky in that I, I got this so young because my body was able to bounce back. I had no complications from the surgery. Uh, I had it done at an incredibly young age. Um, and of course, the next gauntlet that I am approaching is removing my ovaries, which I know will lead to a lot more, um, you know, just things to keep in mind and probably changes to my health and potentially my physicality, my sexuality. But I'm going to approach that the same way I've approached every other aspect of the BRCA1 mutation, which is just these are the facts. This is the card, you know, this is the hand I've been dealt and, and in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that bad. Um, in terms of your second question, what do I wish I had known about the surgery? Um, I was, uh, I mean, I, I was aware that this was gonna be the case, but I think maybe it was even more pronounced uh, in the aftermath that I was really, really effed up on drugs <laughs> for, um, many, many days, um, weeks, uh, you know, I knew that these surgeries, especially the mastectomy were very long and would involve lots and lots of anesthesia. Um, I was on a morphine drip for, um, several days in the hospital. I was inpatient for, I think two, uh, three days, two nights, uh, and then went home with Toradol and Percocet and all that. So, you know, that's something that I think if, um, if you are somebody with a history of 
um, of addiction in your family or within yourself, that is something to be mindful of because it's no joke. I do know many people who have gone through this um, who um, weren't addicts themselves, but who just don't respond well to to painkillers. And so they got through it with nothing more than Tylenol. And um, that was not my experience. And in fact, I was studying for my final or my midterm exams. Um, and I was supposed to take them shortly after my surgeries. And I had to push them back even further because I couldn't even lift a pencil um, for a while. So that was something that, again, I was prepared for it, but it's even more intense, I think, once you're on the other side of the surgeries than you might realize. Yeah, I think uh, for a lot of women, you know, we do counsel that you have to think about the timing of the surgery relevant to who can help you. Are there kids climbing on you? You know, do you have to lift things? Because these are, are real issues. You know, you can't go back to work, you know, the next week. So uh, Rebecca and Max, uh, suggestions for parents you know, for when they're talking to your kids. Obviously, you guys have a very straightforward communication uh, style in your family. But is there anything that you can suggest for, for folks, you know, about when they have to talk to their kids? I don't know. What do you think? Well, as you say, the uh, uh, be very upfront. Be very, uh, um, uh, A, supportive, of course, uh, that this is, uh, uh, this, you have this gene, you have this potential situation, uh, m uh, you know, stay on top of it. Uh, and that's with really any medical condition. You know, I was fortunate, particularly now as I look back on my childhood, to have a mother who religiously, you know, whether they could afford it or not, and there were very many times when they couldn't, uh, believed in every six months a checkup. This is back in the early 50s. And uh, to, so really staying on top of your health, you know, not, not in an a, a, a anxious way, just this is something you do. You, you work it into your routine. So I think the thing is, uh, I'm always reminded of the book that came out in the, I think the seven, 60s or early 70s by a woman named, I think it was Betty Rollins. And the title of the book was First You Cry. And then you pick yourself up and you address the problem the best you can. Um, you know, you're uh, in life, everyone is, uh, you're gonna be lucky to some people, not as lucky as some other people. So you've got to deal with what you're uh, given. And I think the support, when Allie made her decision, there was no, oh, I regret this, I, look, I, I, look, I wish I hadn't, it was nothing like that. It was informed decision-making, which led to action and I mean, it was sort of a good life lesson for almost anything you're faced with. I think Becky would uh, agree with me on that, uh, that, uh, you know, if you regard any diagnosis as quote unquote bad news and don't want to deal with it, that's, in my view, the worst thing you can do. You, you, you must deal with mm -hmm. it. And if we could just, if I could just say one or two other short um, lessons I learned from having gone through the experience of prostate cancer. One of the things, uh, and I've spoken quite publicly about this on many occasions, but I do believe that uh, bi biopsies should replace, uh, should be an adjunct to a PSA test. PSA test is a good indicator and men, most people are biopsy, never, I'll never have that. The way th that biopsies are performed now is so non-invasive compared to even 10 years ago that uh, I can remember uh, having a, a, a biopsy and the, typically they, they take 12 samples, they send it to a pathologist and uh, uh, it was so non-invasive. I always said, look, just to, the, to, to my uh, um, urologist at the time, just keep going, just get the whole thing. I mean, just, it, 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 it should be almost a protocol that is mandatory. Uh, I do get screened yearly for PSA level, which is, uh, you know, in my case, 0 0.000001, which is not something to worry about PSA, but it, the, 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 the gene can show up anywhere. I, um, I try the best uh, I can to monitor any situation. I've really gone, uh, recently gone through treatment for Barrett's esophagus, 
uh, with aphasia, which as you know, is something that can lead to, if not treated, uh, uh, lead to cancer. So I would recommend uh, particularly musicians who leave, you know, <clears throat> dinner at two in the morning and go to bed, uh, and uh, uh, it's not natural. Uh, so get that checked out. And I have very good uh, 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 physician who does that. But uh, when you start delving into the specifics of prostate cancer, and in my case, I believe uh, referred by the BRCA gene, uh, so-called, uh, you you really see how far it's come in terms of breaking down what kind you have, what your Gleason score is, which I won't go into, but uh, it's not something that men should be um, uh, uh, hesitant to go full bore in treating. And that starts with, if someone says to you, get a biopsy, get a biopsy. Uh, my PSA level had always hovered a little high, three, two, sometimes it would drop down to three, three, six, and then it would drop down. You know, this is a variable uh, uh, antigen in your body. The real difference was it went from 3.2 to 5.4 in a matter of weeks. And that can be caused by an infection, that could be caused by, believe it or not, sitting on a bicycle or a drum seat. And uh, so there was a whole procedure to, to eliminate those. And uh, we finally did the biopsies and uh, I had two, uh, as the doctor said, uh, garbanzo size, tumors in the lower left quadrant, the upper right quadrant. So um, it's something that can be dealt with. It's particularly for men, uh, if you suspect it. Uh, my brother-in-law died at 51, uh, who just wouldn't do anything about it. It's just, a, you know, uh, getting old and uh, uh, it could have been uh, completely treated. Early detection and, and proaction is very important. I know we veered a little off it, but as an oncologist, you know how important that is, is to, uh, uh, to, to get in there and do, do what you can. And as Betty Rollins said, first you shed a tear or two and then you take action. And that's what Allie did. And that's what Becky and I are, 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 are so proud of our daughter for having done is that this is my situation. This is what I'm gonna do about it. I'm not gonna look back. I'm going to endure the, uh, uh, the procedure the recovery, uh, which is spread out over uh, almost a year uh, in terms of reconstruction and uh, going in there with grit and, you know, we, and, and sort of in our family, dark humor jokes, <laughs> which that helps too. <laughs> I have a dark my sense of humor. Is, my favorite is, and this is in my book, but uh, I said, I, you know, I, I had my mastectomy over spring break. So when some of my uh, fellow students were down in Cabo uh, showing off their boobs. I was getting mine removed. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So, <laughs> I, I would like to be a fly on the wall at your kitchen table conversations. But so, Ali, you took this experience and you you did write this this amazing book. So tell us about that. What motivated you to write the book? Part of it was um, the questions I would get once I told people what I was doing back in two thousand nine. Uh, I was met with a lot of questions about why would you do this so young, um, things like that. And there wasn't really a community that I felt existed beyond the one that my wonderful doctors had provided for me. Um, there were a couple of books at the time, including one by Jessica Queller, who I think is also a, a Bassler Center um, uh, person. Um, but uh, it was a few years pre-Angelina Jolie, which really, for me, I felt changed the game. And so uh, at, uh, throughout this whole thing, I knew that I wanted to put something into the world that built on my experience to hopefully help other people. And at some point, I just thought to myself, wow, this, this book doesn't exist, uh, collecting the stories. Um, the subtitle is 30 Powerful Stories, and that's because there are 30 incredible women who share their stories from uh, pre-vivers like myself to um, women who have gone through breast cancer once, twice, multiple times, uh, to those who are living and thriving with metastatic breast cancer now. And they talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it's there to be a virtual uh, community for people. And I think that's 
all the more uh, essential now when we're all, uh, you know, challenged, we're not meeting people in person. So it's important to have, as you mentioned, Dr. Domchek, just support from all different um, areas you can get it. Sometimes it's your family, sometimes it's your chosen family, uh, and sometimes in the case of my book, it's my hope that it can be uh, the stories of, of strangers uh, who you pick up and read. And I think the book is, uh, you know, particularly important for our providers. Uh, it's important for us to hear how we come across sometimes uh, without intentionally doing so. Uh, we're used to sort of uh, sometimes speaking very clinically, and it's it's you have to recognize who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, what the vulnerability is at the time, and and be very careful because uh, people are in uh, can be a precarious state. So there are a ton of questions. So I'm going to knock off a few, and then we have some specifically for you. We had questions in advance, and we have questions on the chat. The chat's been great, by the way. There's a lot going on in the chat. One thing I wanted to just address quickly is the issues of insurance. Uh, many people, there's a big uh, chat about insurance and discrimination. <clears throat> so the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, signed by Bush, uh, did, does prohibit the use of genetic information to be used against you for your job and for health insurance. And also the Affordable Care Act has some of those uh, has health care provisions in there as well. However, GINA does not protect against the use of this information for life insurance or disability insurance. Um, and we it is uh, I know some uh, there was a comment uh, from some that they weren't able to get insurance. We've been monitoring the situation. It does depend on the details of your situation. If you've had a cancer, that's going to be much more uh, difficult to get life insurance. A lot of people don't use a lot of the insurers don't use. Um, the genetic information that use your family history against you, which means that if you test negative and there's lots of family history, that can be used against you still as well. There's attempts at reform. Florida actually has uh, been putting in uh, reforms in place and uh, countries like Canada and the UK have been doing some reform. But in the meantime, yes, this is a part of a pre-test counseling session that some people do choose to um, uh, buy a life insurance or disability insurance or long-term care insurance. Those are the three that are not covered uh, uh, by Gina. And so feel free to talk to uh, folks more. Another person uh, mentioned that she lives in Alabama with limited resources for genetic counseling and uh, follow-up visits. This is a great point. And if we had to say the one tiny itsy bitsiest light of COVID, it's been the availability of telegenetics and telemedicine services. So for instance, we've been counseling all over the country these days um, I, you know, I did a consult for someone in Alaska, so you have to start worrying about time changes, which is just lovely. Um, Vassar does have, run by Angela Bravery, a robust telegenetics program that pre-existed before the COVID regulations kind of broke down some of these walls. We are really hoping that um, post-pandemic that we'll be able to do a lot more telemedicine for these reasons so that we can provide access and resources to people no matter where in the, in the country uh, they live. So now getting back to you guys, because uh, I'll alternate. Um, I, I One question, and I, I'll take it to all three of you. You've talked about your immediate family communication. Tell us what it was like to have more extended family communication. You know, you're, you know, do you have cousins out there that you were able to talk to? Because once you know about this information, you know, we try to disseminate it as widely in the family as we can. Can you talk about that at all? Dad, well, maybe, yeah. Yeah, Ellie. Yeah. Go Please on, go Ellie. Well, I was going to say that uh, in my extended family, um, uh, I, I'm uh, my, myself and my younger sister are the youngest of uh, uh, at least a dozen, maybe more, because uh, the first cousins. Uh, um, and so we've. Uh, uh, I have cousins who are in their 90s, and uh, health and sickness has been a part of our life. But again, from in this family, it's very the, the, the idea of proactivity has always been very strong. Not, you know, it's unpleasant, but it needs to be done. It's uh, you know facing it, dealing with it, and doing the best you can with with what you have. Um, uh, in my own case, it was sort of like, you know, uh, my father my father had colon cancer. Uh, uh, you know, I was, uh, I believe, 30 uh, when he uh, succumbed to colon cancer. Uh, and he was always throughout his life worried about everybody else's health and not his own. 
and that caught up with him. It was a tragedy, and he was just a few years older than I am now. Um, uh, so I just think that, uh, you know, my mother uh, was uh, uh, you know, had, had, had five sisters had had so much experience with uh, uh, with illness in various stages that it was again uh, just something uh, to go through. And she actually, I think, several a few two weeks before I had my prostate surgery, she was ninety uh, what ninety six I think, and had her gallbladder removed, emergency basis, you know. And uh, uh, so you know, the the open and the honest way is always the best. You you deal with it, and you know. What, uh, uh, and hopefully it's not heartbreaking, uh, but you take it a step at a time. It's a process and you have to work through that process. Would, would you think that sort of says it? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in my case, I, I have a very, very small family. I don't have cousins. My parents both passed on very young, but uh, luckily for me, I have a lot of very close girlfriends who are basically like my sisters. And so I was able to talk to them. They were most supportive of me and, you know, thought what Allie was doing was the right decision for her. And um, yeah, that was- yeah. In my case, yeah. with my health issues, I have uh, the great fortune of something that Becky doesn't have. I have her. <laughs> and, uh, me so, too. Yeah, I got the better end of the deal in terms of, you know, getting us through whatever had to be gotten through. Uh, so, you know, my rock, our family's rock, the center line down the, uh, the road, uh, you know, after all, uh, I, uh, I, at heart, I'm, I'm a rock and roll drummer. I've done other things, but I'm a rock drummer, you know, and, uh, and everything attended with that. And, uh, 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 but again, education, which is something in, in my own personal extended family was, you know, that was, uh, uh, a cultural thing that uh, my family was just very into. Um, yeah, so belief uh, in science is, is definitely uh, a, a value. Uh, a couple, another a few to knock off is that um, I, I, someone raised the question that one of their relatives had ovarian cancer and had not gotten genetic testing, uh, even though um, uh, they were, uh, uh, she was, her daughter was diagnosed in 2010. And that is unfortunate. It is recommended that every person with ovarian cancer get genetic tested, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity. Another question uh, that was brought up is pointing out that although these gene mutations are more common in people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, where one in 40 individuals of Jewish ancestry has a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, they are seen in every race and uh, ethnicity, et cetera. In, in white Americans, for instance, one in 280 uh, individuals have BRCA1 and 2 mutations when they're not Jewish, and that same number uh, is about the same number in, in Blacks. And so um, we really we really try to say, if you have ovarian cancer, or you have a family history of ovarian cancer, you should get testing. And I'm very sorry that your relative did not do so. Uh, we are trying to enhance education and outreach about this uh, to get more people aware of this. Uh, we actually are trying to also employ the electronic medical, medical record and for, uh, and uh, utilize, you know, marketing campaigns to try to get the word out as well um, because of this crucial and life-saving information. And I will say that your your attitude about the, the sort of, this is it, we need to deal with it, let's figure out a plan, is just so important. Um, and, and hopefully we can uh, keep that up. I will tell you that there are a thousand questions. So I'm just, uh, I'm going to answer one last one related to COVID, because obviously um, someone asked about IVF, I'll try to deal with that one too. So related to COVID, um, everyone, if you can't have access to get your COVID vaccine, get your COVID vaccine, whether you're in the middle of treatment, wherever you are, um, our, our, our national guidelines basically say, you have access, go get it. There's nothing worrisome about the current vaccines, these mRNA vaccines, they don't change your DNA, they don't disrupt anything, they just make a protein for immune system to respond to. Millions and millions of people have gotten these vaccines. It's the way out of this whole mess, uh, so go for it. Um, there was a question about IVF, in vitro fertilization and pre-implantation genetic diagnostics. 
This has actually been, uh, uh, we have all sorts of things um, in the BAS, uh, the BASR website, and we have had sessions specifically on IVF and pre-implantation genetic testing, which is going through in vitro fertilization, screening the embryos, and then re-implanting those embryos that do not have the gene mutation. This is the right thing for some people. It's not the right thing for others. It's not always covered by insurance. So it's complicated. And it's also honestly a less fun way to get pregnant than you know other ways. So we at the Basser Center are determined to have better options for future generations so that we have better choices available. So that you know in 20 years, a young woman um, will, she might have a surgery as an option, but she may have a whole host of other options behind, uh, besides screening, because that's in the end of the day, uh, what we wanna do. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time, Rebecca, Max, Ali. This has been an incredibly powerful uh, discussion. And uh, we really hope that uh, all of you that are listening, um, just keep in uh, mind the Bastard Center. We have a lot of programming. And again, we're really, really grateful for your uh, time and attention. So thank you, Ali, Max, Rebecca. Well, uh, thank yeah. you. If I, might add a, if I might add a final word, uh, someone watching at is someone I know who texted me who said, are you really on the beach? And I was like, Absolutely not. This is a digital background, but we thought it would be fun uh, just to have a digital background. You don't we want are, to see this, what this room really yeah, is. Yeah, like. you're definitely, we're not on the beach, uh, ladies and gentlemen. No place. <laughs> well, we wish we were on the beach. Is so we'll take it. So I think Sherry. Yes. So, but yep. we felt <laughs> that they were, wanted to be, you know, we all wish we could yeah. be, but. Uh, uh, it's just, it's just a back backdrop. That's my years in television. You know, it's completely fake back behind us. You can see. I just wanted to thank you, Susan, Ali, Rebecca, Max. I am just blown away by our discussion. And um, it was just very personal and insightful and thought provoking. And as a mother and a carrier, it just, it, to me, it resonates so deeply. So I really, really appreciate this. And if you want to learn more about the parents' leadership community and ways you can get involved, please contact Carolyn Brown. I think she's going to put her email in the chat box. I please, please go visit bassard.org, our website. We have it's a great resource for all things BRCA related. Um, and all attendees tonight are going to be added to our monthly e-newsletter, and you could stay informed of. BRCA research and other advances. Thank you all for attending um, and have a great evening. Thanks guys.